Nate Bowling is here to chat with us. We told you that we were going to bookend this day with local speakers who are not in real estate, and we opened. By the way, backstory, um, we were having lunch with Side by Side Creative, talking about this conference and how this would go down, and we were envisioning it, and Ann Jones was like, oh my God, like what if we had Nate Bowling at the end? And Eric was like, no, this is what happened. And Eric goes, you can't get Nate Bowling. He's so famous right now. And I was like, do you fucking know who she is? <laughs> And we texted him. We texted him in front of Eric Hamburg, and like, is Eric Hamburg in the room? I was say, Where is Eric? Well, I'm talking about him behind his back. Anyway, that man just spoke at Harvard last week. So, so get it's ready. It's a privilege to have him here to speak with us. And uh, Nate is a former client. He's a, a teacher at Lincoln High School. <laughs> All right. Number one client for life. We, we came to know each other through the real estate process. We have a lot of mutual friends. Uh, my husband's a principal teacher for many years, and so uh, this is somebody who's near and dear to us, and it's really your privilege to get to hear him talk on this. This topic, I guess, to me, is sort of the culmination of the conversations today in my mind and something that I hope you will take forward. My biggest wish is that you will take this discussion forward and take it back to your individual communities, at in your home, at your brokerage, you know, and the greater uh, area that you work, and continue it, please. Well, we uh, appreciate you all being here. We're going to bring Nate up. and. Yep. Uh, you ready? He really needed a lapel mic. I apologize. We're going to saddle him with this uh, cordless. He's going to be so, only half Nate gesturing. When I was a kid, I remember going to St. Paul Baptist Church, which is located up here on 19th Street. And I remember the pastor always saying, and I remember this always, a good sermon ain't got to be long, and a bad one shouldn't. And so since I'm the last thing standing between you and happy hour, <laughs> I will keep this brief. Uh, as you've heard, my name is Nate Bowling. I'm the 2016 Washington State Teacher of the Year. And oh. and I teach, live, and serve the neighborhood that way, uh, the east side of Tacoma, where honestly none of you are going to visit tonight but that's okay. I wanna to talk to you all today about the three forces that I think are most involved, most active, and most important in building community. If you go out and look in any neighborhood, whether it's a high-income neighborhood, middle-income neighborhood, low-income neighborhood, there are three forces that shape that community. And those forces are law enforcement, education, and real estate. Now, oops, I said four, sorry, three. There's three forces, anyway. And if we think really hard about how law enforcement, education, and real estate shape the patterns that we live in, shape whom we live in, shape how we feel about communities, you'll understand that like, I as a teacher and you as realtors, our lives and work are connected. So I sat down with Bill Gates this summer and we talked for about half an hour and he posted a video about it. And in the video, I dropped this kind of thing that I call myself a nerd farmer. Okay, so I'm a nerd farmer. It's my job to work with low-income students and cultivate a love of education in them. But my farm is built by the seeds that you plant in the way that you distribute and help distribute and contribute to the way that neighborhoods are set up. And so you as realtors have a formative role in what happens in neighborhoods and a formative role in what happens in communities. And it's not just like a quality of life thing, it's an intergenerational life-changing thing. And don't think that's an overstatement or think I'm overselling that. Like, my life destiny was shaped by events that happened long before I was born, and others were shaped by events that happened long before they were born as well. This is my house. This is not where I live now, but this is where I grew up. It's a 1918 four-bedroom, 1,800-square-foot house. My father was born in Laurel, Mississippi in 1930. And if you know Mississippi, like I know Mississippi, first chance he got, he got the hell out. <laughs> and he got stationed at Fort Lewis. My father served in the military in the Korean War. And when he decided to leave the military, he decided he was going to stay here in the Northwest. Because this provided him a better opportunity, a better quality of life, and let's be honest, some, some modicum of safety. 
My mother was born in El Dorado, Arkansas in 1940. If you know Arkansas, in the situation from my family in 1940, when she could, the first thing she did was get the hell out. In particular, what happened is my uncle went into the Air Force and he was stationed at uh, McCord Air Force Base. And through chain migration, hey fam, life's a little better up here, they came up here and this is the house that they were shown on the hilltop in Tacoma. This is my friend at Abby's house. My friend Abby's family moved to Tacoma about 1960, about the same time. And they were shown this house on the north end on North 47th. Now, if you look at the house, four bedrooms, about 1,800 square feet. I like my mom's house a little better selfishly, but you know, it's got good bones. I don't know real estate terminology too well, but like, I don't know, I assume people like that picket fence look. It's got some nice stuff going on. But can I tell you that my family when they came here and Abby's family when they came here were not shown the same houses and not in the same neighborhoods. This is my city. And so I'm gonna pause for a moment. I'm gonna pause for a moment. So as a classroom teacher, like I'm used to talking to students in short bursts. So the idea of talking here for half an hour like isn't gonna work for me. So I'm just gonna ask you to look up there and can somebody in the front row please yell out, what does it say in red? Hazardous. 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 This is the legacy of real estate practices here in this city. This is not only the legacy of real estate practices here in this city, this is the legacy of real estate practices in every major city in America. And through the process of redlining, we have created intergenerational poverty and we have negatively impacted the net value and the net worth of families of color all over the country. Period, full stop. This house, this house. This house, this house. My family was steered to a house on the hilltop, a beautiful home, a home that I grew up in, a home that I love, a home that I'm gonna to visit tonight on the way home, right? But in doing so, my family was cost tens, if not hundreds of thousand dollars in familial wealth. And we really need to think about this. We need to think about the long-term impact of the choices that you make as realtors and the communications that you have with your customers and clients and what messages you reinforce, what messages you hear, and what messages you, messages you reject. I'm gonna pause for a second now and reach in my pocket. So my name tag for this conference says, Gathering of Community-Minded Agents. Community. So my family came out of the South, and one of the things they used to love to do was send me back to the South every year. So every summer, I would go to Arkansas, and let me tell you, hated it. They looked at me like a weirdo. They're like, why you talk so fast? I'm like, why you talk so slow? <laughs> but, but the one thing I loved is, is that like, when I got down to the South and, like, and saw people, I saw them, and immediately I felt a connection. And I'm like, I don't know you, but we're family. Anne and Marguerite have vouched for you all. As far as I'm concerned, you're family. And since you're family, I'm gonna be very real with you and talk about what needs to be done. Ladies and gentlemen, I had a totally different plan for this presentation up until Tuesday night. And I'll be honest with you, my faith in what's possible has been shaken. I hear and I see things that my father talked about hearing and seeing back when he was a child in Mississippi. And I fundamentally have concerns that our democracy, our very democracy, like this great thing we brag about, land of the free, home of the brave, out of many one, all of it, all of it, we may lose. I've traveled around the world. I've been to Caracas, Venezuela. I've seen that in Caracas, the wealthy live on hills and everybody else lives below. I was in Paris last summer. I know what life is like in beautiful, scenic Paris with all the sights. And I also know what Paris is like in the suburbs where all the immigrants are forced to live. That's not the future I want. That isn't the future you should want. That's not the future I want for my students. That's not the future I want for my city. That's not the future that I believe in. But the thing is, is you all are thought leaders in the industry. And I'll be honest, right now, I'm basically asking you to be firemen and firewomen because you all are thoughtful, community-minded realtors, 
but out there, there's some less thoughtful people who are just dumping gasoline on the fires of inequality, on the fires of discrimination, on the fires of bigotry, and on the fires of segregation. So back to this map. One more time, what does the red say? Hazardous. Hazardous. My mom's house? Oh. Which one's the light? That's the light. Hazardous. Hazardous. My current house where I live right now? Hazardous. My students where they live? Hazardous. Hazardous. Abby's family? A best. And so I want you to think about this now. My grandmother bought her house in 1960. Abby's family arrived in 1960. If, so I know realtors hate Zillow, but it's all I got, yo. So <laughs> if we take a Zestimate for what it's worth, and I know it ain't worth much, but just bear with a brother, please. <laughs> if we take a Zestimate for what it's worth, what could Abby's family have done with the extra $150,000 that their family earned by doing absolutely nothing? Or conversely, what could my family have done with the extra $150,000 they lost through no fault of their own? I'm gonna pause for a second. Turn and talk to your neighbor. What are some things that Abby's family could have done? Go. I got you. If you haven't switched it, let the other person talk. Other person talk if you haven't already. Now, don't get sidetracked. Go ahead and finish your thought, please. And then bring your eyes here. Thank you. Right, uh, yeah, sorry, full teacher mode right there. So let's just call out, what are some of the things that Aunt Abby's family could have done with an extra $150,000? Bought another house with their favorite realtor. Start a Education. Start a business. Say what now? Save, Save money. Retirement. 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 Travel. Travel. So let me tell you some of the things that Abby's family did with that money. Abby graduated from college debt free. Abby's parents loaned her a down payment for her house. When Abby got, graduated from high school, she got to go on a month-long trip through Europe. These are the things that families were, have been able to do through intergenerational wealth that they've created through zero work or zero effort. Put conversely, I was not able to graduate debt-free. My mother did not lend me money for my down payment. It wasn't possible. And I am blessed I am blessed. There are so many people out there who were born into neighborhoods that were labeled as hazardous, undesirable, who through no fault of their own just have fewer resources and have less, less, less in every possible way. This is a map or a chart of the academic achievement of basically every school district in the United States. On the bottom, on the x-axis, it says poor and disadvantaged to affluent advantaged. And on the y-axis, it says average achievement grade levels. Every school district in the United States, 2009 to 2013. Again, very quickly, very focused. Turn and talk to your neighbor. What do you see? And then go ahead and finish your thought, please. Go ahead and finish your thought. Marguerite, you're always loud. Can you talk about what you saw with the four schools, please?
interesting. So when your clients go online and they Google good schools, good neighborhoods, this is what they're getting. In actuality, what they're getting is white schools, white neighborhoods. If you want to talk about effective education and you want to talk about quality schooling, hello, who the hell are they? <laughs> who are the schools and the districts that are taking low-income students and helping them beat the odds? Those should be the number one rankings in whatever BS algorithm there is that's getting spit out. But you know what? <laughs> but that's not how it works. That's not how any of it works. The, they're going to go home and they're going to go to, what is that crap site, great schools, and they're going to Google it, and it's going to spit out that Curtis High School is the best school in Pierce County. It ain't. <laughs> Y'all could walk into Curtis tomorrow and teach those kids. Their needs are met. Their parents care for them. There's like resources and extracurricular activities. The kids' basic needs are met. Y'all couldn't walk into these schools. But these schools never come up. These never, ever come up in the databases. Whose job is it to communicate to your clients about these schools? The other thing I would point out is, is that I feel like I was blessed. I was born in 1979, went to school through the 80s, and so like, I know that like, via stats that 1988 was basically the peak of school integration. In 1988, we basically had the most integrated schools we've ever had in American history. And in 1988, the achievement gap was smaller than it ever was in American history. Those two things are not a coincidence. But we made a decision, and we walked away from inter integration. We said it wasn't worth it. And so now we've resegregated our schools, and our schools are now more segregated than they were when the Brown versus Board uh, case was heard. What do we do? I say to you again, as thought leaders in the profession, as respected realtors, as shapers of community, you have to change the narrative about what it means to teach, live, love, and serve in neighborhoods. Now, am I saying you grab your super delicate client millennials and say, hey, let's go look at a house in the hood? No. <laughs> That's not the conversation I'm asking you to do right now. I'm not a crazy person. But you do have an obligation to interrupt stereotypes, and you do have an obligation to disrupt narratives, and you do have an obligation to lead a different conversation about what's happening in these communities. Because if y'all can't do it, who will? This is a map of Pierce County. So in the biz, we call this private reasoning time. I'm gonna give you a moment of private reasoning time to kind of look at what's going on, on the map. What I wanna point out to you really fast is, is that, oop, going back. The larger the circle, circle, the higher the poverty level. And the more red area is, the shorter the life expectancy. So the bigger the purple circle, the higher the level of poverty. And then red is basically life expectancy. So green areas have the longest life expectancy, red the shortest. Go ahead and just look through that for a moment, please. If we allow the perpetuation, and if we encourage the perpetuation of housing segregation, then we are sentencing poor children to premature death. Period, full stop, new paragraph. Now, I mentioned integration a moment ago. Here's the funny thing about integration. The black children that were sent to white schools perform better because those schools had better resources, sometimes better teaching, stability, you know, you know, you know. The white students that were sent to black schools did fine. They didn't go to a black school and come out a crip. <laughs> they did fine. But again, we as a society have decided to walk away from all of that, and we've now resegregated our schools, and I would say to you, the reason we have segregated schools is we have segregated neighborhoods. 
And I think that Thursday, sorry, that Tuesday night should show us that there's no impetus from on high. There's no going to be government push or policy push towards integration. And so the push from integration is going to come from one place. You. You. If we're really going to be one nation, indivisible, it is going to be up to realtors to interrupt systemic racism and housing patterns. And you know what? That's a tough job. And I don't know how to, I don't know how to tell you to do it, but I know it needs to be done. And so at this point right now, some people are like, man, this dude done lost his mind. So let me back up a step really fast. Middle-class white children into a predominantly brown school, those middle-class white parents will agitate and demand that that school gets better. And their agitations and demands will cause policymakers to pay attention. This sounds crazy, but I'm starting to believe that the only way we can, we can save public education in high-poverty urban schools is to basically put middle-class white kids in the rafts with us. Because you all, and I'm, I'm looking at the crowd right now, you all, as middle-class white people, have the political capital that the families of color and communities of color don't have. Truth two, this situation we're talking about right now with these unequal schools, there's no political impetus to change this any time in the near future. Essentially, through white flight and suburbanization, middle-class families have said nah to the offer I made last bullet. And they've, I ain't mad. <laughs> The man's trying to hold me down. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> and they've shunted themselves off into these suburban schools that are well-funded, and they do whatever it takes to make sure those schools are taken care of. And so what that means is, is that the people who have get more, and the people who don't get less. And we're having this great divide and this split and this split and this split. And you and I are the only people in a position to stop it. The last thing I would say is, is that all teachers are not created equal. And so I'm going to ask you all, real estate to the side just really fast, just thinking about policy advocacy and the work that you do. I'm assuming that wherever you're from, because here in Tacoma, the realtors are important, that y'all are important too. You should be advocating for policies that incentivize and encourage our most effective educators to work with our highest need students. But guess what? That's not how it works in real life. Instead, all the incentives for an effective educator like myself is to get the hell out of a high-need school and get to the burbs, which are better funded. I don't know about where you're from, but here in Washington State, our schools are funded mainly through state money, but then a huge chunk of local money. Well, who has more local money? Come on now. Come on now. Come on now. And so whose schools get more local money? Come on now. Now, whose schools need more local money? Okay, and so one of the real truths that we've seen here in Washington State is, and this is a God honest truth, in areas in which the majority of the students in schools are students of color, and a majority of the homeowners are white, they can't pass a local levy to save their life. Because they're not in it together anymore. Those homeowners do not see the kids in those schools as their kids, and they're not in it together anymore. This is the part where I didn't plan for Tuesday to happen. This is the Electoral College map from 1980. 1980, chill, we're good, 1980. This is Reagan, this is Reagan. And Ronald Reagan got 56% of the white vote in 1980. Sweeping victory. This is 2012. Barack Obama, sorry, not Barack Obama, Mitt Romney got 56% of the white vote in 2012. Mitt Romney, went back to Utah. Our nation is changing. If our nation is changing demographically, we absolutely cannot have this separate but equal system and just doom large, por large portions of our population to inferior education because for them an inferior education will lead to an inferior life outcome. One of the truths my mother told me when I was young, well, younger, was about George W. Bush. George W. Bush was a C student that got into Yale and then became President of the United States. C student got into Yale and became president of the United States. Nope. <laughs> nope. Right? The margin of error that our students who live in poverty and our students of color have is very, very slim. 
And the policy choices that we make as a society and that you influence as realtors and as meaningful adults can be life-changing for them. And so I would just implore you to think about this. Think about this. Here's the road ahead that we have to walk and kind of figure out together. Educational inequality and what's happening with our schools is both funded by real estate and reinforced by real estate. Because we're dependent on local levy funding, low-income low income communities get less. High-income communities get more and then use that benefit to grow their additional onward wealth in a multi-generational way. We have to figure out a way to equalize this. And I'm not talking about socialism. I'm not talking about wealth redistribution. I'm just talking about how can we as people who are more affluent with our needs met, how can we contribute to the well-being of others? What are the tax policies we can advocate for? How can you leverage your, your capital as a realtor to help pass a school bond? I mentioned it before, I'll say it again. The big sort has a really, really bad ending. When you have just extreme haves and extreme have-nots, things dissolve. We saw what happened in Zimbabwe last decade. And like, is Tacoma gonna become Zimbabwe? Is New Orleans gonna become Zimbabwe? No, 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 no. But I'll say this, when I visit places like Costa Rica and visit places like in Mexico, like really nice communities, what you see is the wealthy people live with these beautiful walls and broken glass on the wall. Why do they have broken glass on their wall? To keep others out. Is that the future we want for America? Like, is, is that the direction that we want our nation to go? Again, I say to you, these changes are happening slowly at a glacial pace, and so we're not noticing them. But if we pause and think, if we really pause and think, is our society marching towards a direction in which more people have more equity and have better life outcomes? And if not, and those people become desperate and angry, what happens? Like, I don't want to overstate this case, but like, this is civilization. The basis of our society in America is, is that if you go out and you do the right thing and work hard, you can have better outcomes and things will get better for you. But that deal, that deal is hanging on by a thread right now. The last thing I would say with you, say, and I'm going to close with this is, is that housing segregation is the result of generations of intentional government policy at the federal level, the state level, and the local level. I may have been born yesterday, but I stayed up all night. This didn't just happen accidentally in every urban area in the nation in a uniform pattern. This is not an accident. At every level of government, through government policy, we have created the situation that we have today. It can only be undone by intentional efforts. But here's the thing. Tuesday night should have showed us that the government is not coming to the rescue. There is no political will to change the current situation. You are either going to have to create the political will, foment the political will, or support whomever you know who has the political will. I'm going to close with this. Oh. I would have closed with that. <laughs> I'm not asking you to walk out of this conference room or this ballroom and go lead a march down the street, because I'm not doing that. I'm going to see my mom. But I am asking you, what are, the just, what are the simple steps that you can take? What are the steps you're willing to take? What political capital do you have that you're willing to risk? What relationships are you willing to leverage? Because this sounds like an overstatement, but literally, civilization that we have, our society, our social contract, is up for grabs right now. What are you willing to do? Thank you. Dudes in the back, like dudes in the back, I ain't even mad, man. Don't worry about it. <laughs> okay, so we were hoping, if you have the will, to maybe do another Q&A. You guys up for that? You got to have some, like, amazing questions. Questions only. <laughs> Brandy, go for it. 
the hazardous. Sure. That's, mm, mm, mm. That is a federal housing authority red line map. And those maps were produced, if I could. Oh, oh. Nope, apparently not. Uh, those maps were produced basically for every urban area in the country. And those maps were used to determine who could, yep. Okay, those maps were, determined, were used to determine uh, where home loans could be issued to. And then based on where home loans could be issued to, people were steered. And so if you were an African American arriving in the Northwest in the 1960s, then you were steered directly to oh, one of these. This was an FHA and VA underwriting guideline. So if you were over 15% black on the census tract, they would not fund the loan. So it's like a high rental rate in a condo. Does that make sense? 15% black, no loan, no and, VA loan. And these maps exist for every urban area in America. And so then we look, and we look at housing patterns, like this is, yeah, I know you didn't know, I know. When we look at housing patterns and like look at why neighborhoods look the way they look, why does Inner Harbor Baltimore look how it looks? This is why, like this is why. And in doing so, we deprived an entire generation, multiple generations of that $150,000 of familial wealth that Abby's family had. Just to clarify, that, that, Kendall asked me that it was till 1968, not now, yep. obviously. And, but 68, and my family arrived in 60. Just, and many times those occupations for the two families were the same. Oh, they there, could be co-workers. You know, that's actually a good point, because my mother was a nurse, and Abby's mother was a nurse. Question. Are you starting to see any kind of a change? I, I mean, I, I have a lot of families, young families, moving into some of those East State, Hilltop, East Side, because that's the only place they can afford, no matter what their race is. Are you seeing a change at your level of... Uh, there often is when they're young, and then when it's time to have kids, they want to find great schools, and so they go where, to where the great schools are. And so essentially what's happening is, is that like young millennials are living in diverse neighborhoods uh, because it's all they can afford, and then as soon as they want to have children, they're getting as far away as they can. So one of the things we come across, right, is when we're asked about schools, where are the good schools, because we are not allowed to answer that question, at least here in Washington, you can't answer that sort of question directly. We are looking for, who, who said earlier the easy, was that, um, Seth was talking about a, a question gets asked and you go with the, the easy answer, you lie, right, or you do some homework. So I think one of the challenges is we go to great schools, realtors go, because it's uh, linked up on Zillow and it's available and it's easy and it keeps our hands clean. What would you recommend, so a realtor wants to give an answer, so in our case, like Nate's at uh, Lincoln High School, if you don't already know about the Lincoln Center program, they are doing amazing work. Uh, when people ask us, I know Marguerite has a tried and true practice of, uh, I'll refer you to parents of kids, you know, who have kids in these schools. What would you recommend if somebody wants to find out more about a school in a neighborhood? I think it's worth pointing out that I met Anne in a teacher friend of mine's living room, and so, or kitchen. If you want to know what's happening in a school, like going on a website and Googling is actually the worst possible way. Uh, if I'm a realtor, much in the way that you have networks of people who you talk to about marketing and you have your meetings in coffee shops and have those relationships, if I'm a realtor, I'm, I'm creating and cultivating relationships with teachers who I know because teachers will give you the straight dope what's happening in schools. Uh, I can tell you there are some schools that are great on great schools where the instructional practices happen within those walls are horrific. And on the flip side, there's some really, really, really struggling schools on the great schools ranking that have some of the most impassioned, dedicated, driven, effective, and loving practitioners in the business. And so teaching's relational. I think I'm picking up from you all that real estate is relational. And so one of the relationships that you should be cultivating is with the educators who you know, and educators in the area, who can give you the informed, honest, straight dope. Next question. Amy. Um, I wanted to ask you this since maybe we were going to be here. Just um, given that, like, the whole thing you're saying about the political will and, you know, all of that, and knowing that you are a teacher of middle school, like, I've tried to think about, like, where will change come from? And... In my mind, it got whittled down to middle school and thinking about my education in history. And I just wondered if you felt like, as a, as a teacher, um, do you see like your ability to make an impact on your students in like history today versus like the history I got when I was in seventh grade? 
Sure. But, but what, 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 what I do in the classroom is less important than what you all can do. So like, yes, in my classroom, I'm talking about issues about integration, issues of justice. Uh, in my human geography class, we talk about housing patterns and how housing patterns drive, li drive life outcomes. But what I would say is one of the most effective changers of minds that I've seen is Marguerite. If you, so she was talking about her online behavior earlier on. I've seen her have a very patient back and forth dialogue with people, people who I'm like, block that a-hole, who cares? And like, she's been able to persuade them. And so, like, yeah, I guess that we can wait for the generation of seventh graders to come up and be the better 35-year-old consumers, but like, I don't think we have time for that. No, I mean, because I'll say myself, I feel like I've had, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to unlearn or relearn myself, yeah. and, but that's just one person in one community. And yet, like, just from an educational perspective, are we just still perpetuating like our white history and raising another bunch of people that don't know this, don't, well, don't consider Well, not in it. my classroom, okay. right? <laughs> like. <laughs> but what I would say also is, is, is don't dismiss and sell short what you just said. You're just one person. You're right, you're one person, and you convince one person. Hell, if everybody convinced one person, then we're there. And so don't sell that relational like retail politics short. Like you are an influencer and I, I promise you're convincing more than one person. If you, if you're serious about justice, then like justice becomes an evangelical issue for you. And realtors are in the business of selling stuff. And so if you can sell a fixer upper, then you can sell justice. <laughs> like, I, I, I fundamentally believe that. Like, if you can sell homes, you can sell justice. And, like, I, my ask of you, and, like, I, I'm never going to see most of you ever again. And I'm sad about that. <laughs> but my ask is, of you is, is, like, think about the privilege and power you have, and how can you, how can you leverage the privilege and power you have for the better? I was just curious what your thoughts are on charter schools and a complete kind of redistribution of students based on different interests and kind of have each school be a niche and then parents have a choice. Sure. Uh, charter schools are super controversial in Washington State. Uh, I hate the charter discussion because it takes people who should be allies and makes them enemies and that's really gross to watch. I would say this. There are really effective charter schools that make a difference in kids' lives every day. And there are charter schools that should be closed immediately. There are really effective public schools that make a difference in kids' lives every day, and there are public schools to be closed immediately. I'm ambivalent about model, right? But I'm a fanatic about results. And so, charter smarter, private schmivet, if you're making a difference in kids' lives, and you're improving the quality of life for people in poverty, then like, I will ride with you, period. Well, you ain't telling me, I gotta pay more. Like, I'm not, I, I drive a Kia, for God's sakes. I know I, need, I, know I get more. So, uh, can I just give you a really concrete thing that, like, to, to prove the point you're making? Uh, there's a young lady, so every year I work at ASB camp uh, in central Washington, and there's a young lady who I've known for six years, and she went to Davis High School, which is a high poverty, almost all Hispanic school in Yakima. She graduated from UW, no, she'll graduate this year. And so she went to Davis intending to be, to be a math teacher. Okay, so she's majored in mathematics, she's walking out of UW, and she, her plan is to go back to Davis and teach. Davis High School, no, don't clap yet. <laughs> Davis High School, because the student population is majority brown, can't pass a levy. And so they're 100% dependent on basically the state salary allocation, which is $35,000 a year. Who the hell with a degree in mathematics is going to work in Yakima for $35,000 a year? And so teacher compensation is an important issue politically nationwide. Uh, I'm the state teacher of the year. My dear friend Sean Sheehan's from Oklahoma, and he ran for uh, state senate this, this year. And he ran basically on the issue that if you want quality, you have to pay for it. Because the starting salary in Oklahoma is pitiful. It's about $27,000 a year. Y'all, that can't cover my bar tabs. Like, <laughs> $27,000 ain't nothing. And like, granted it's Oklahoma, but like, fam, still. Uh, how, but one of the issues is, is that to pay for that, there was a property tax. Realtors in Oklahoma opposed right, opposed the proposition that was going to create a property tax to fund teacher salaries. And so that's, so people talk from the stage about costing yourself business in order to like, right, 
your bottom line in, principle, in principles. I was sitting in the back and I'm like, who wants a bigot for a client? But I kept it to myself. Um, <laughs> bigot spend. <laughs> True, but like, who, so, so it's that zero sum game that like, if we spend an extra dollar in taxes, that might lower my commission or cost me a sale or lower, 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 lower. So therefore, I'm gonna oppose bringing effective educators into work with students. Like, that's only, you can only function in that way when you don't see yourself as a citizen of a society, but as a taxpayer and a consumer. And so I would just say that like, we need to embrace our citizenship mentality. Like the story of like where taxes come from, the original origin of stories is fascinating. Um, traders in Athens basically paid taxes because the Athenian military provided a safe harbor for them to do business. Like that's the origin of taxation. The origin is, I'm benefiting from being in this urban area, in this community, so I'm gonna pay back to make sure this place is maintained, is safe, and is quality. That's the origin of taxes. But we don't see it that way. We see taxation as this burden that we don't wanna deal with, and, and oh, I don't want my taxes going over there to those kids. And in doing so, like, we're destroying our society. Uh, we think about like school outcomes. Like the, the future of our society is not gonna be determined by how well your kid's doing, your kid's doing, your kid's doing, your kid's doing. Your kid's doing. The future of our society is gonna be determined by how our children are doing on the aggregate, right? And if our children on the aggregate aren't doing well, then we're doomed. Next question. Uh, <laughs> um, I really loved the answer regarding schools and talking to parents. Uh, that was really helpful because I do get that question. Another question that I get a lot is uh, regarding safety. And my first house was on the hilltop. I love the hilltop. I get broken into more in Fircrest than I did in Hilltop. Yep. And I can share my personal experience, but I don't quite know the best workaround to the safety question because I, I love these neighborhoods. Yep. Uh, and I think as realtors who work in these areas, we, uh, they're beautiful. They're, I just can't get around the safety well, but, but question. You, you nailed it right there. Is so I grew up on Hilltop. I live on the east side now. Yeah. My house never gets broken into, into on the east side. And sold the house to my dear friend Cheryl Bacchus. And Cheryl's house got broken into, what, twice in a week and then her car? And so, like, it's, I'm not sure about where you're from, but, like, property crime is an issue here, right? And, like, most of the property crime is driven by drug addiction, you know, break into stuff, steal money, buy dope, whatever, 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 whatever. Um, Wherever you are, there's issues of safety. And so like, you just tell the story of a community. We, we can change narratives. Like, there hasn't been nearly the violence on Hilltop that there was you know, when I was 15, whatever, or I was seven. But like, that narrative is lasting and enduring. All you can do is tell the story you know. And say, like, you, you may have heard this, but like, this is this community. This is this beautiful old lady who's been here since 1974. This is uh, the guy that tends the traffic circle. He's been doing it for 10 years. And just tell the story of the neighbors in the neighborhood. The story of the neighbors in the neighborhood is more powerful or should be more powerful than the narratives from the news. But that means you have to be, but that means you have to be in the community. Having that conversation. But again, you're community-minded agents, and so we should be getting in the community. Forward. Nate, can you say that thing you said um, when we had that conversation? About so, um, you know that one time um, like, that, that you said that you used to have rice, like wasn't it? <laughs> it was before that okay. um, <laughs> that you said that you used to have a conversation with students that were like talented in class at or like oral. Sure, sure, sure. Can you uh, talk about that? Yeah, I, I, so I teach AP government, and it used to be that like when I had a kid who could explain things really well to me, like about court about court cases, I would say you should go into law. I don't do that anymore. Now I say you should teach. Right, because if you can convey complicated information to people in simple ways, then like you should be a teacher. But Marguerite and I were talking, and uh, there's this thing like in teaching, there's like justice-oriented teachers. What we need is justice-oriented realtors, because you're. <laughs> I want to take you places. You're awesome. Uh, Vasi's amazing. Because you all are just as involved as I am in shaping what comes out of communities. Like I, I teach who's on the blocks that you all have built through your sales. And so it's a matter of justice. Like I, I have a dumb pun in my head about being a realtor and keeping it real. I'm gonna keep it to myself though. Uh, You're I did not just, the first. Okay, great. But like <laughs> I, I work with what you create and we need more people with justice mindsets doing the work that you do. Or we need more of you to think about justice when you do what you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.